Um, is it possible to turn these lights over here so you can get the full impact of my glorious slides? Is that, is that okay? That's great. Thank you very much. All right. Too dark. That's, 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 can you see that better? Does yeah. it affect, does it affect okay, let's, or, let's put it well, up a wee bit. Let's yeah. not to hack off the camera. Let's, these ones are off and then those are on. Right, okay. So it, there's a compromise. Yeah. All of life's a compromise, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, good, good, good afternoon. Just good afternoon. Um, so nice to be back in Scotland again after so long. Um, it's been at least six weeks. I was over in the other city, points towards Glasgow, but doesn't mention the name. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to talk about openness, and I, I really want to try and build on what the, my colleagues have been saying this morning. It's been fascinating listening to all the different uh, uh, dialogue on, on openness and, and so on. And it, it's quite a big, quite a big topic, though, isn't it, really? Um, but before that, I, I want to talk about some other things. I want to talk about what we're doing with the content that we produce and what we're doing with the, uh, I suppose, the, the knowledge that, that is available now. Uh, and I tweeted out earlier on that um, when you research and then you publish your research, what you're doing is you're educating your community. Do you agree? You're educating your community. Or you, you can try and keep me still, but it's like trying to nail down a cloud. I do tend to wonder. Um, otherwise, I can't think. Funny enough, isn't it? movement causes thinking for me. But um, great, okay, thank you. I'll use that as well. But um, it, it, it is true that when we, uh, when we tend to publish our work, we're educating our community. So I think it's beholden to us. Um, it's our responsibility to make that as open as possible so that we can educate the widest part of our community. It's also uh, beholden on us that we should make it um, free or, or at least accessible. And openness and freeness aren't always the same thing. So just being that away from here, we'll get feedback. <laughs> Technology, eh? Technology. <laughs> right, uh, but uh, I mean, this first slide here really says it all to me. It's about learning. The technology is just a, a set of tools, really. And whatever you use it in terms of technology, um, it's a set of tools. And really that should support the, the, uh, the learning rather than, than actually lead it or drive. We don't want technological <laughs> determinism. Um, now, Graham's asked me specifically today, because he gave me such a good plug on his book, on my book, uh, uh, he, he's, he's asked me for, for a request. He's asked me to tell a story that he enjoys. And I might switch the gender this time, so I, I offend all the males rather than the females this morning, right, this afternoon. And so the story goes like this. Um, the story is that um, there's, a, there's a, a couple living in... Um, the back hills of, of, of Virginia, and, and uh, they're quite primitive. They live in a very traditional way. This is 1913. And uh, they're drawing water from the well, and they, they go out hunting and so on. And they've got a son with them, and, uh, and they haven't really seen anything outside of their own, their own little uh, hillbilly village or little, little town. But what happens is they, they win a competition to go to the Big Apple, to New York. And they get very excited about this, and they all dress in their best clothes, and they get on the Greyhound bus, and two days later, they arrive in Times Square, and they get out, and they look around, and, and the buildings are huge. They've never seen such big buildings in their lives before. And, of course, the people are all over the place. They've never seen so many people. They didn't know that there were that many people in the whole world, let alone in New York. And so they stand there gawping around for a bit, and then after a while, they say, let's go down to Macy's. Anyone heard of Macy's? Yeah, Macy's is a big department store, and I think it was built around about 1889, and it was the biggest department store in the world at the time. And so they get down to Macy's, down Broadway, three blocks down, and they go inside Macy's, and again, they're amazed at the hugeness of the place. Big atrium with lots of staircases and people everywhere. And after a while, the guy says, um, I'm going off to see the sports uh, department. So he goes off and leaves the poor woman standing there on her own with her son. And she's standing looking around, and uh, she notices over in the corner, there's a, a line, a queue forming. And so she goes over to have a closer look at the queue. And she goes over, and, and as she looks at the queue, she notices there's a door that kind of opens up like this. And people go in through this door into the wall, and the door is shut, and a little dial goes, one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, and the door is open, and the people have changed. <laughs> and this happens again and again. These people going into this strange machine and coming out, and they're changed when they come out. And she, what, is this, uh, what is this devilry that's going on here, this strange technology that changes people? And so... Then she notices a little old man walking in with a cane, and, and he walks in very slowly and gingerly into this door, and the door shuts, and the, the dial goes up and down. And the door's open, and out walks a young, buff guy with a six-pack, muscles all over him. And she stares at him and then turns to her son and says, Son, 
Go and get your father. <laughs> it's a throwaway joke, but the, the, the point is there's a serious underlying message there, and that is that technology that is sufficiently advanced, as Arthur C. Clarke, is indistinguishable from magic. And that's the problem with technology. We get, we get seduced by it, and we forget about all this, and we then buy into the best technologies, and we subscribe to all these different tools and so on, and then we think, oh, what are we going to do with them? So when you're subscribing to tools like Mendeley, you've really got to have a purpose. You've really got to have a kind of a goal, an objective. And there are clear objectives that you can select, but obviously don't buy into anything unless you've got the objective first, unless there's a problem for you to solve. I mean, I, I, this guy says it better than I can. Um, it's not a silver bullet. All right, but um, having said that, let's move on. I want to introduce you to, to Learner 2.0. This is, this is the person or the people that you're, you're teaching now. And I just want to, to kind of set the scene on openness by, by talking about who these um, young people are that are coming through our doors of our universities and into our libraries now. And uh, so the first thing to, to I want to tell you is this, that um, according to a lot of research recently, the average digital birth of children happens at about six months. That's the first time when they start to appear on the web. That's the first time when they start to get involved in digital tools. I don't know if you've seen the video of the, of, of the young uh, girl, and she's uh, maybe about 18 months, two years old, and she's playing around with an iPad. She's pinching it, tapping it, swiping it, having a great time with it. And then they replace it with an old magazine, paper-based magazine. What does she do? Pick it up, start to swipe it, pinch it. Nothing's happening. She looks at her fingers. Are my fingers working? She touches herself, touches it again. It's no good. It's not happening. So she throws it away, gets the iPad back again, and then she's happy again. This is what we're doing to our young people. This is Steve Jobs programming our next generation in a different way. It's interesting to note that all of the young people that are in our schools at the moment, and very shortly the young people that are coming through our doors of our universities and libraries, they will have no knowledge of the last century, which is the century that you and I were born within, and educated within, and are most familiar with. They have no knowledge of it. Most of them are younger than Google. Shortly, they'll be younger than Facebook and Twitter as well. That's the generation. But I, I dispute that. I actually, you know, um, I think that uh, digital birth happens long before the children are even born there because people are posting up um, in bit true pictures of, of their children from ultrasounds and so on. You, you know this is true. This is happening. There are ethical and moral implications to this, of course, but I think we have to understand that these children are now immersed in these new technologies. I don't subscribe to the digital natives perspective, just before you ask. I don't think that's um, uh, anything more than based on anecdotes. What I do um, understand, though, is that the more you habituate into a technology, the more familiar you're going to, be, you're, you're going to become with it. So therefore, I, I look at the digital residence idea from White and Laconia, which talks about you know, the residents being people who are habituated into a technology and understand how it's used, and the, the ones who are the visitors or the tourists and, and who have very little idea about it and maybe are even tim intimidated by it. But um, let's move on. This is, this is really from young people onwards. This is what happens. Uh, learning is changing because they consume content, but they also remix it, create and share content themselves. And that locks into openness in a very interesting way, as you'll see shortly. And it also uh, locks into the idea of uh, developing communities of practice and interest, which also we'll talk about. Um, and games-based learning. These two lads here are playing a game. They're, little, you know, they're brothers, actually. Um, can you see how interested they are, how rapt they are, how curious they are? I think the whole point about technology um, for young people is that they are so familiar with it. They're intimate with the tools that they bring into your classroom and into your library. And I, I think that we really have to try and make better efforts to encapture, you know, to, I, I suppose to really encompass and, and, and to, to exploit the power and the potential of these tools uh, so that it will actually enrich, extend and enhance learning in many different ways. Three biggest fears of teachers using technology. Do you identify with this? First one, how do I make this work? You know, how do I avoid, you know, problems with the technology? Um, how do I avoid looking like an idiot? Yeah, familiar? And the third one, they will know more about this than I do. I want to contrast that with the fears of young people using technology, just to show you the difference. Here we are. 
see the difference? Stark, isn't it? Um, that's what they worry about. You ask them. That's what they worry about. And uh, ju just, to, just to show you um, the contrast in even more detail, if you show a young person one of these, do you remember these? Who actually used one of those? Come on, admit it. Almost everyone in the room has used one of these. They used to be the sole way of getting data across, didn't they, before, uh, before we, we got wise to it. Imagine showing um, a young person one of these. They'll say something like this. Wow, you've just 3D printed the save icon. <laughs> That's their, it's their frame of reference. I was sitting on a train the other day. Um, I'm always on trains or in planes or taxis. And I, I, sat, on, I was sat on this train the other day and, and um, I was listening to these two young lads talking. They were probably just in secondary school. They were probably year, year um, nines or year eights or something. And they were sat talking on, on, the, on the train. And one of them said to the other, he said, I like the new Sherlock. He said, it's great. And you're Benedict Cumberbatch. I can never say that name. Benedict Cumberbatch and, 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 Mar and Martin um, Freeman. Great, great series. And, it, and his friend very safely said to him, yes, I, I, that's a very good series. But I prefer the classic version, the one with, the one with Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, bingo. This is, this is it. They've got a smaller frame of reference than, than, than those of us who have been around a lot longer. So they're going to see things in a different way. So this is all background, really. Th these are students now in my, in my class. This is what they look like. And I see a lot of you doing the same now. Um, there's not much change in terms of the way you're sat. You're sat in tears. You know, I mean, Rose, not, not tears. <laughs> sat in tears. I mean, they might be in tears when they listen to the project I've got for them next week. But the thing is... Um, you're sat in rows and you're receiving information, but you've got, you've got personal windows on the world. You're actually being able to drill down. I, I, I don't know how many of you are actually Googling me at the moment to try and find out who, who the hell this guy is. But you can imagine that's what people will do. They will check out information that comes from the front now. They will be able to go digger, digging deeper. They will be able to go wider than what is possibly available without any, any technology. There's a form of openness I think we ought to uh, start embracing. Uh, and I know a lot of my colleagues, well, not a lot, but several of my colleagues are very threatened by this. They don't like students with open screens facing away from them in the room because they don't know what they're doing with them. They don't trust the students. They might be playing World of Warcraft or Doom. They might be um, looking at other stuff, which is more nefarious. Who knows what they're doing? Um, I tend to trust my students. I say to them, look, you know, just make sure it's relevant what you're doing. Uh, because you can do so much with what you've got in front of you on that personal window in the world than you can by just making notes on their own. Uh, and so things are changing. And uh, then we have to ask, what are, what are these open windows? What do they do? What, what is their function? So obviously they're going to be drilling down deeper. Obviously they're going to be asking questions. But they can do other things as well. They can have conversations with people. I was having conversations on Twitter with people about what was going on in the first session here earlier on. And you guys were being talked about. Did you know that? You guys were being talked about on Twitter. Um, and those who, the, uh, of you who were following the, the hashtag recon underscore 15 hashtag, um, you will know that there's some conversation going on behind the scenes. It's a back channel. So you can create back channels quite easily. That's another form of openness. And it, it makes available to you... Um, a whole variety of different perspectives which aren't being represented solely in the room. Uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, several of my students uh, recently, um, what, what I tend to do with my seminars and my, my lectures is I have a back channel that runs behind, a Twitter back channel, and we choose a hashtag which is peculiar to that one session or that one module. And they use that to actually write their comments and to um, put challenges out and, and question each other and discuss and so on. And two of them, uh, about three years ago, were actually using the, the, the back channel um, to talk about a book that I'd set them as a set reading. And they mentioned the book and they mentioned the author's name. And uh, they also met, had a question and they were discussing the question. So I thought, I wonder. And so I retweeted it to my followers, knowing full well that the author actually follows me on Twitter. And he's in America. Within 20 minutes, he was on the screen answering their question direct. And the, the, they, were, they looked at they went... And the whole room suddenly started buzzing. I said, what's happened? They said, is that the real? I said, yes, it is. It really is him. You know, and can, we ask, and can, we, can we ask him? Of course you can. That's why he's responding to you. And they had a conversation with him there. How motivating is that? This is, this is open access in the best possible sense. This is so inspiring to students. Think about the possibilities. Um, 
UNESCO have something interesting to say about this. They're talking really about communities of users. I mentioned earlier on about you're your educating your community with your research. Well, open access really is all about the community of users. It's all about serving them. Brian Lamb once said something uh, very, very profound. He said, it seems um, in a world where there's so much need and so much financial crisis and so much poverty, it seems perverse that we are hoarding knowledge from people when they desperately need it. And I think that really is something we need to start thinking seriously about. I know other people this morning have said that publishers, the onus is on them to try and change their business models so that they make more um, knowledge and more research available to people who desperately need it without having to come up against paywalls. Uh, but we'll come back to that point later on. Um, it is really about, or it's based on the premise of sharing, this idea of openness. Openness has been around for centuries. It, it's not something that is invented now, but I think we're now seeing it become more mainstream, uh, simply because we have the tools to start making things open in, in, a, in a more kind of, I suppose, pragmatic way. I was talking with um, Martin Weller. Uh, we were together in Barcelona last week at the Eden Conference, and uh, he gave a keynote called The Battle for Open. Has anyone heard of Martin Weller? Uh, if you haven't, look up Martin Weller. He's M. Weller on Twitter, and he's at the Open University. He's a professor of educational technology there. And his two books that he's brought out, the first one was on open scholarship, and this new one is called The Battle for Open. They're both available, obviously, as you would expect, freely downloadable on the web. Um, and uh, I think it's Ubiquity Press uh, published them for him. Yeah? And um, he talks about the battle for open. He says that, actually, the battle for open has already been won. Openness is now starting to become mainstream, but it doesn't feel like a victory because there's still so many blocks, roadblocks there to stop openness becoming completely ubiquitous. There are so, still so many um, uh, ways that we can improve access to knowledge. So it's a pyrrhic victory at the moment, but it's all about sharing. And it's about the community itself, of course. I mean, um, you, you can talk about um, the community being defined as, as a group of interacting people living in a common location. That was the old way of defining community. But if we're going to go more uh, up-to-date than that, it's now about you know, no need for a common location. It's now about a common interest. This is why Leib and Wenger talks about, talk about communities of interest as well as communities of practice. This is why they talk about um, what we would call lurking. They talk about it as legitimate peripheral participation, which is a great way of saying these people are on the edge and they're, they're learning and they're, they're kind of on the edge of the community, but... To actually become involved, they have to become more um, core in terms of what they're doing and, and how they're interacting with others in the community. And that's an interesting concept, which I hope we can come back to uh, as well with the time that's available. Um, so there's all sorts of questions about this. What, what are the characters? Well, communities celebrate. Communities uh, do a lot of, um, of backslapping, I know, but that helps people to become engaged. Communities also connect. I don't know if you can see this picture here, um, what it is. The, that there is Barack Obama giving a speech just before he got elected as, as the first uh, Afro-American um, president of the United States. And you can see in the foreground there, all these people, it's in Germany, in Berlin, it's his Ich bin ein Berliner speech. And just before um, uh, he got elected, you see all these people here. And can you see what they're doing in, in the foreground? Every single one of them just about is holding up a camera or some kind of... There's even a guy here, like, if I can point it out. He's, he's holding up a laptop. He's live streaming. <laughs> yeah? this, this, this is the connected age that we live in. This is the community that we belong to now. And the more connected we are, the more powerful it becomes. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a close-up of it there. But um, we're also about online en masse, I think. That's a, a nice play on words. It's about every, everybody being online together. And, and uh, in, that, in that kind of context, nobody's really anonymous anymore. I was sat in a, in a conference, uh, I think it was Alt-C, actually. Martin Bean was actually keynoting. Um, you, you know what he's like, Robert Lee's and uh, he, he was uh, talking about some, some aspect of educational technology. And at the end of his speech, I was sat right at, right at the back, and there were loads of guys in front of me with their laptops open. And... Are there any questions from the floor, said the chair. And, and another Aussie in, in the front row got up and said, I'm Professor such-and-such such from so-and-so university in X. Uh, and do you know, within two seconds, the two guys in front of me had both Googled that guy to see who he was. Again, it's a form of openness. 
We can talk about open scholarship here. We can talk about the fact that actually open scholars are those who not only make all their content open for use and all their data and all their, all their publications and all their everything else, but they also open themselves up for constructive criticism. Now that's quite a courageous thing to do, but I think as academics we should be doing that more. You notice on some of my pictures here, you see over here, just to see, see that, and on some of the other ones, I, I've also got a, a Creative Commons um, license itself. Um, what I do with all these pictures, I check to make sure, firstly, that they're copyright free. And I check to see what Creative Commons license is available on them. And then I replicate that when I use them on my slides. And I make them all available for free. And uh, it's, it's an interesting concept because it's all about collaboration. You know this from T-Mobile now. It's completely organized by, by mobile phones. Um, watch the video if you haven't seen it, it's spectacular, it's in <coughs> Liverpool Street. But the whole point about this is everything can be collaborative if we want it to be. Everything can be crowdsourced or, or um, made available to the whole community if we want it to be. It's, I suppose, us really that are stopping that from happening. It's about all those things uh, into user-generated content. And user-generated content in itself is quite interesting because a lot of questions have been asked about the quality of that. And of course it's variable. Um, it's very patchy as to whether it's high quality or low quality or useless. And uh, I have to say, a lot of stuff out there is quite useless. But um, there are ways of actually um, uh, ensuring the quality, of that, as we've seen this morning already. And uh, we came up with, the, in the Conceive project back about um, 10 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just getting over the bubonic plague. I'm <coughs> still there. Um, content that is created and shared freely by students and our teachers and which has not been through a process of formal peer review. Now, that could be debatable as well, because actually a lot of content out there that isn't under formal peer review is being informally peer reviewed. And some of that peer review is actually quite rigorous. Just write a blog post on a controversial subject and see what happens. You'll see that there's peer review out there. And it's a different natured peer review. It's peer review, but not as we know it. But nevertheless, it's a way of checking and balancing. And, um, I mean, Wikipedia, for instance, uh, a lot of people have dissed Wikipedia and said, oh, well, it's just, you know. I've had, I've had huge um, uh, rows on, online with people like um, La Larry, uh, what's his name, the guy who, who uh, set the system up, I forget his name now. Larry? No, not that, 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 that's, la that, that's the guy behind Creative Commons. Yeah. It's, the, it's the guy who actually, with Jimmy Wales, set up, uh, I've forgotten his name. You've made such an impact on me. But, uh, but uh, yeah, J Jimmy Wales and this guy, Larry, whatever he's called, set, you can probably Google it and someone will shout it out within a few seconds. And they set up Wikipedia between them and then they split because um, Larry uh, didn't like the idea of, 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 uh, of lay people and non-experts being able to produce content online. Larry Whereas Jimmy, Sanger. Larry Sanger, there we are, that's the guy. And, and so Larry Sanger went off and set up his own system, which, which you could only uh, edit if you had credentials and you could prove you had credentials. And Jimmy Wales went his own way, and guess who won? Obviously, Wikipedia is becoming more and more um, content laden. I think it's the largest um, uh, human rhizomatic structure in the world. Uh, I think that's, that's perfectly true to say. And, and there are you know, there's still a lot of errors on it, but um, why don't we say to our students, OK, here's a project for you. And I've done this for my own students. And, and my own students, I say, here's a project for you. Go off and look at Wikipedia, and then find a gap in the knowledge, and then create a page on it, and try and maintain it. See how hard that is. Anyone in the room actually created a Wikipedia page? And it's still there. Hands got hands come down. But some of you have, yeah. It's not easy, is it? It's, it's quite, uh, you know, with the Wikipedia police there, you know, it's, it's not easy to maintain it. Um, and then to keep it and make it accurate and make it relevant to people and to have people coming in and reading it and using it, I mean, that's, that's another type of publishing altogether. And, of course, that's going to be heavily peer-reviewed. But here are six trends for the digital age to look at. Here are the six trends that David Wiley um, identified about, ooh, about 10 years ago now. And I have to say that actually out of all those trends, only two of those have still been realized in terms of ubiquity. So we are now moving very much towards digital. In fact, we're there already. Uh, and we're also very much into mobile now, but are we, are we open yet? Well, that's debatable. Are we completely connected yet? Again, debatable and so on. So, all, all of these characteristics are on the way, but only two have actually been realized you know, in, in the true sense. 
And so we have the technology, but uh, have we got the will? That, that's the question, to be open. Um, I won't bore you with too much of the detail. I'll let you read these yourself. And move on, because uh, I want, really want to talk about this. I mentioned earlier on, I mean, there's the sign again. This one here, um, are you familiar with Creative Commons? Who's familiar with Creative Commons? Who actually uses it all the time? Quite a few, that's really good to see. Now, if I came back here next year, I'd expect to see a few more hands coming up because I think it's a trend that academics are adopting. Uh, and the whole point about this is, is that not only is it beneficial, or you could say philanthropic if you like, but it also actually comes back and there's a payback on it. And I want to talk to you about that. Some of the ways to, um, to, to make your content and your data freely available, but then the benefits that come back are actually quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, this is uh, the work of uh, Howard Rangel. He says, look, you know, networking is one of the most important skills of the 21st century. And it links into what I'm about to say to you. We need to know how to network. We need to be um, uh, aware of the, the power of connections. I tweeted that earlier on. It, unless you understand the power of connections, you won't get Twitter. And you won't get social networks. Unless you understand the power of connections and, and the power to amplify your ideas and your content, you just won't get it at all. People think it's all about sharing what you had for breakfast. That's just the, the basic, that's just the trivia, the NIF map. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, first mobile phone was huge. But that's exactly what we use now, mobile phones. We use them to connect. We use them to create our communities now. Um, they were like bat you know, great, great big batteries with, with a little dial on the front, weren't they? They, they, they were huge. Um, but um, now we've got... Students of all types, children using these, these, uh, these devices all the time. They're familiar with them. I mentioned this earlier on. This is the generation we're talking about now. How are we going to harness the power of it? Communities of learning. This is where it happens. See this guy up here? He's standing on his own there. But he might be connected to three other people through, let's say, Twitter. Each of those might be connected to other people as well. And before you realize it, there's an exponential power of the network. And it goes on and on and on. I, I'm sure you've heard of Stanley Milgram's Six Degrees of Separation. Yeah, heard that expression? Duncan Watt talked about it recently in his book as well. The whole idea behind that is that um, in society, you can be connected to anyone in the world through five other people, your, your, your relationships with them. Um, but I dispute that. I think that actually it's probably down to about degrees of three now, or maybe even two, because with the power of things like Twitter and other social media, we can connect literally to anybody. Um, I met Steve Wozniak. Heard of him? Everyone knows Steve Wozniak. Was. I met him at a conference two years ago in, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, I walked into the speaker's lounge, and there he was ready to go on for his keynote, and I was next on. Imagine that following Steve Wozniak. And, uh, and I, I, I went into the, the, the speaker's lounge, and I was the only guy in there, and he, he stood up as I walked in and shook my hand, and I sat down and I had 20 minutes with him on my own. Are you jealous or what? <laughs> and uh, after that, we made friends on Facebook, we made friends on Twitter, and, we, and uh, we had a few conversations. Do you know, within a week of him friending me on Facebook, um, I was also friended by Sir Ken Robinson, Mitch Resnick, Shelley Turkle, uh, Seymour Papert. Uh, th these, these guys are, are my heroes, and suddenly it was opened up because of one connection that was made. It's phenomenal what you can do and what you can achieve and who you can meet when you use the technology appropriately. Um, it's about you know, creating these collaborative open networks. That's what it's all about. It's about collaborating because you know that you can, that you know you have the possibilities in the palm of your hand. It's a very exciting time, I think. It's an unprecedented time that we're living in now as academics. And we've really got to seize these, um, these uh, opportunities where we can. Dave Cormier, by the way, I met him for the first time this year in London. He's been doing a lot of work on this idea of what we call rhizomatic learning. It comes from the work of Deleuze and Guattari, a couple of postmodernist theorists. And they talk about participatory and negotiated experiences that come from connecting with people. And you know what a rhizome is. A rhizome is it's a metaphor for, for, for learning, really. The, the rhizome itself is really a kind of, um, a, 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 kind of a, a sub Below, below earth root structure, if you like, that grows in all directions. It's got no center to it. It can't really be destroyed. You know, you pull up a weed in one part of the garden, it comes up somewhere else the next day. 
because it's connected underneath. And the whole point of the rhizome theory is that actually it's open, it's, it's negotiable, it, it's, it's, it's mutable. There are so many things you can, you can say about rhizome structure. Uh, essentially, it's about connecting, not just with people, but with knowledge as well. And the connections become more important than the knowledge, um, paradoxically. So that's, that's where we need to be, I think, and to look at our community engagement and the way we connect. Um, again, I won't bore you with this, just to say that knowledge becomes the legitimate part of, 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 um, of the process of, of working together. It comes from that, and, and it, 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 it kind of embeds itself within that. Uh, well, I could talk about the LMS and the PLE. I mean, I, I won't, but I've written a lot about this. But institutional systems are very closed, as you know. Learning management systems, whether it's Moodle or Blackboard or whatever, they're very closed. When it comes to actually opening them up, students will use the LMS when they have to, and they will use their personal learning environment when they want to, and that includes Facebook, because they know that they can tailor it to, them, to their own needs. It's much easier to use because it's much more open. Um, and the folksonomies that come from this, the folksonomies are, are, are basically what they decide to do as a community. It's what's important to them as a community. I did a workshop in Brisbane two weeks ago, and um, I got everybody in the room to take about six post-its and to stick them onto things with labels on them that they found interesting or, or important in the room. And it was amazing what they came up with. But you, you started to see clusters appearing. And you thought, yeah, well, actually 26 people have actually stuck labels on the door there, and most of them have put escape. So that means they must be thinking about going home. But suddenly you see the folksonomy. It, it's what appears that the community has created, which shows their interest. And this comes from a whole range of things like tagging and um, aggregating content and so on. MOOCs, I, I, well, there's, there's your bingo word. I have to talk about MOOCs. Um, just very briefly to say to you that the original MOOCs, the C MOOCs, or the Canadian or the constructivist MOOCs, which were created back in the last uh, decade, were really about trying to open up content and open up learning experiences for people. And they were very much led and, and, and driven by the students themselves. Then, obviously, the big corporations got hold of it, and Udacity and Coursera and all these others, and Merge edX and so on. And really, they started to, uh, I suppose, commercialize it and, and to put it into a box. And I think that was a bit of a shame in many ways, because what it's done now is it, it, it's, it's kind of, um, I, I don't know what the word is, really. Um, it, it's, I was going to say bastardized, but I don't like to swear. But that's what it's done, really, with, with the original context of, of, of the MOOC. And, and now the MOOC is, is something else completely different. And it started to kind of have this epithet of, you know, a, of a shallow experience where students don't complete the course. Um, and and uh, you've got 90% uh, attrition rate and so on. And, and the, sh the learning is shallow. And all, and all of these accusations are, are, are put at it. Uh, but if you go back to the original MOOCs, really, um, it was a great idea. And they still continue in many ways. Uh, we were talking this morning about open access publishing, and I want to just examine that very briefly with you. And I want to talk about uh, my, own, my own open scholarship. This is a paper that I, I published back in, I think, 2006. I published two papers in 2006, 2007, and I just want to compare them with you. You see, the thing is, this paper here was published in BMC Medical Education. I read a lot of medical uh, papers. That's my, part of my background. And uh, this paper was written with two colleagues, and it was published in an open access journal, which some of you may be familiar with if, if you're into medical education. And um, another paper at the same time was published, um, and I'll talk to you about that one in a moment. But this one was open peer review. And instead of being peer reviewed by two blind peer reviewers, it was open peer reviewed by three reviewers. And you notice that when the paper was published, so was the original submission before it was changed. So were all the comments from the three, from the three reviewers, and so were our responses to the, to the reviewers, and then the final paper was published. That, to me, is open publishing at its best. It's transparent. Nobody's hiding behind a wall and saying, I can say what I want about this review because they'll never know who I am. I can be as cruel as I want, um, or as unfair as I want. And that happens, as you know, in publishing. So what happened instead was we've got this transparent audit trail of the paper from start to finish. Um, another thing that happened, 
I mean, there's 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 some of the examples there. I'll make, I'll I'll share these slides afterwards, Graham, so that you can see them see them and use them again. Um, the other thing was I, I I actually published another journal at the same time, um, and it was a closed journal, and it took three years to publish. From the point I submitted it, it was nearly three years. It took them 18 months to find two reviewers who would review it. And then it took another 18 months once I'd sent back the responses and the new version for it actually to be published in a paper-based version because it was the REF year, wasn't it? And there was a backlog. They gave it a DOI and they published it online, but that wasn't the same thing as having the paper-based publication out. Um, the other uh, the open journal, it took five months from start to finish. The number of citations on the closed journal are currently 27. On the open one, 1,023 academic citations. Check out if you want. You can check out my Google site afterwards and you see if this is true. I don't know how many people read the closed journal, but I know that as of yesterday, 214,714 people had read the open version, or had actually hit on it anyway. And the journal impact factor, we, we, we all know what we think about the the impact factor, but that, that, those are the impact factors of the two journals. And here, here is my Google citations list. You can get this if you, yourself, actually. If you, if you haven't got one of these, go into Google Scholar and create one. It's instant. It does it instantly for you. It uh, takes all your publications and, and gives you the citation lists, and you can click onto those, and it takes you down, and you can see who cited you. And it gives you the H index and the I10 index and so on. It's a really useful tool. So there's the proof of, of what happened. And the other, the closed journals right down below. These are all open access journals, by the way, apart from uh, the British Journal of Educational Technology there. Um, it can amplify your content as well. So I spoke at a conference. It was a, quite a small conference in a, in a, in a local school. It was, I think they had a 15 people there. And I gave this presentation on Web3. You know, the, the semantic web, what can we expect in the future? And uh, at the end, there were no questions. And so I, I thought, great, okay, well, I better go then. That was a bit of a damp squib. And as I was walking out the door down the corridor, one of the teachers came after me. Steve, Steve, sorry. So we're, we're all a bit kind of um, phased by what you were saying. We, we, you know, we, we didn't know how to frame our questions. It's so new to us. Can you share your slides for us? I said, yeah, okay, I'll put them onto slideshare.net. No, so I did, and I tweeted it out. Within the week, I'd had 15,000 hits. Comments, people were taking it, downloading it, using it. Um, I think the current uh, number there is 73,000. You can see it down on the page. That was as of two days ago. So 73,000 uh, people have looked at that, and 199 have favorited it, 29 comments, and 2,215 downloads. So these tools amplify your content. If you make them open, things will happen. If you keep them closed, then only a few people will see it. How many people actually read journal articles? Well, I'll tell you how many people read my blog. It's around 100,000 a month now. And that's very, very low compared to some people. I can tell you, some people have millions of people reading every month. Um, but the whole point about blogging, it's another form of publishing. It's, a, it's an open access form of publishing. You make your content available for free, and uh, you get a reputation for writing stuff that people want to read, and that is peer, you know, it's not peer-reviewed, but it's, it's been referenced and it's been uh, thoroughly researched. Um, and so you, you build on your own reputation as a researcher, and you put your blog out there, and suddenly you'll find that people want to read it, and they'll start to comment, and you have a conversation with them, and you learn more than you'll ever learn by just writing stuff in a journal. I'm not saying that journal you know, writing is, is bad, I'm just saying it's another alternative. Start thinking about the possibilities, the alternatives. You can remix, you can repurpose. Um, and because I put a repurposing CC license, I'm going to finish in a moment, because I put a, a CC, a Creative Commons repurposing license on all my um, content, um, this is down there, this is, the, this is um, actually it's not on that one, but it, it, it's, it's the, uh, the, the reverse arrow uh, symbol. Um, this is what happens. People look at your content, and what they do is, if they like it, they repurpose it themselves. Yesterday in London, I saw somebody using one of my images that I'd taken, a picture I'd taken, in their slideshow. I said, that's one of my images there. He said, oh, yeah, well, but thank you for sharing it. It was under Creative Commons. You know, no need to ask my permission. Um, 
This is uh, one of my blog posts, which somebody in France has decided to translate into French without me asking. Here's another one. This is a, a Spanish version of one of my slideshows. And uh, Thomas Zumerland has actually done that. And uh, again, he didn't have first permission. It's interesting that when people started to create versions of my content in Spanish, um, my vi visitor hit went through the ceiling because suddenly the whole of Latin America woke up to the fact that here's another piece of information to read, some more research to find. So the exponential kind of amplification of content, I think, is really possible with these new tools. Um, it's also about breaking down the silos as well. Breaking down silos of, 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 of where the barriers are. That's what we're all about. Um, I just want to quote Mark Holper here, just in case you're wondering. It's about adaptation. It's about remembering that we've got a whole new generation of young people coming in now who see technology differently to the way we do. It's about grasping the new possibilities and thinking, okay, how can I do this better or wider or broader or deeper? It's about finding new ways to amplify the research that people really desperately need out there and making it more open and accessible and, yes, interoperable. And really, as Peter Drucker says, it's, it's really, really a folly to look at, the, the, you know, the, the, you, you, to use yesterday's logic to actually look at the turbulence of today. It really is folly. And I'll just finish with this um, final slide for you. So Socrates said, knowledge that is acquired under... Oh, I'm so sorry. So I'm embarrassed. This is a big mistake. I asked my son to find a picture of Socrates. <laughs> ah, I knew something like this would happen. I'm never going to trust him. <coughs> He's a football fan. Um, I'm going to have to... I'll, I'll just have to change this one moment. Um, I'll have to search for the... Um... Anyway, it was Plato that said it. So I have to find a picture of Plato. Hold on one moment. One moment. I'll find a picture of Plato. Damn it, that's Socrates. Um, wait a minute. I've got it, there we are. D finished. Perfect. What you've just witnessed, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, is the survival of the fittest content. It's the evolution of knowledge. It's Darwinianism. <laughs> and that, I think, is part of our future. It's part of what we'll see when we use these technologies. Thank you very much. I've been nosebleed territory. Hi, really glorious slides. Um, I have a few comments, I'm going to try and make them quickly. Uh, one is uh, regarding the copyright. Uh, I heard that in a previous uh, presentation as well. The photographs and other content that you use is not devoid of copyright. If it has a Creative Commons license, it means it does have copyright. Creative Commons licenses are actually copyright licenses, and they would not exist without copyright. So that's one issue uh, to be aware of. The second is kind of ironic that you had a photograph, a, a slide that said, you know, blog repurpose, and it was under the ND license, which you cannot repurpose if you have an ND license. So it would be really nice if we practice what we preach, and which is to, to uh, adopt as uh, open a license, or even a lack of license, which would be a CC0, which is an actually an absence of copyright. Mm -hmm. uh, the third comment is about this notion of uh, you know, having so many connections, and you, know, and, and you did mention you know, your, your open access journal had 240,000, something like that. People who had read it and then you modified it, you, well, at least they had mm -hmm. fit it somehow or the other. So we have to be careful as, the, as our ability to connect has increased, the meaning of what that means of connections means has also changed. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the best example I can think of is, I don't know if you've seen the news, this, uh, this young kid, Dylan Roof, who, uh, who shot nine African Americans in, yeah. in South Carolina day before yesterday. Yeah. Apparently, his Facebook account, more than half of his friends were African Americans. Now, that word friends has a very different notion there. You know, yeah. it's, it's something that Facebook has appropriated. Mm -hmm. They were probably not friends, but were probably curious about him or you know, wanting to check out his hateful 
diaries, etc. Mm -hmm. Which kind of goes back to the comment the gentleman over here made, I don't know if it was you, about being able to buy different accounts and whether all metrics can be reasoning. Mm -hmm. I'm not against all metrics. I think these are great, great experiments to try and figure out new ways of measuring impacts uh, and saying we have to be careful and not just barrel down the road thinking that that's the answer. Anyway, that's all. Well, uh, excuse me, but I didn't detect a question there. So you had no question. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Yeah. Um, hi, Steve. I, I, um, I think I just, just you have a question here. Yeah. As you know, um, for us, the early bird, I mean the early stage of research, we are not. I have a lot of um, amazing ideas to, for us to use the anal analysis of the researches. Plus, um, my supervisors often told me you have to um, keep your mind yourself because you have to have some contribution so yeah. that you can do the publish and yeah. especially for the PhD students you have to do the thesis or something yeah. and uh, as I am doing the social science I'm not doing the really scientific topics yeah. I'm doing the finance and economics so sometimes we're not doing the lecture work which is really yeah. practical yeah. we are doing something like creative thinking so yeah. sometimes it's really afraid of the thinking might be stolen by I do appreciate that we should be open mind and open mm. to everyone and information should be open open access. Mm. But do you have any suggestion for the early stage <coughs> researchers how we can you, um, be open minded at the same time and we can protect our own yeah. contribution? All right. Um, from my own experience, when, when I was um, writing my own thesis, my supervisor said to me, um, Steve, you should publish. So I did. Um, and actually, uh, I, I got my work out there even before I'd published my thesis uh, or presented my, my viva. And um, that, that was their approach. I know other uh, PhD supervisors who will say the opposite, like yours. You know, don't publish yet because you want to keep it to yourself. Um, I, I guess it, it depends on the nature of your research. It also depends on um, uh, the advice that your supervisors give you, whether you're going to take it or not. I mean, there's, there's lots of factors involved in this. Um, the other part of your question was, was about, um, so the second part. Uh, because the social science is different from the practical one. So we're mm, dealing yeah. with the thinking. Yeah. Um, I, I, th I think, I think um, because all subjects are different, you're going to get different responses and different reactions about whether you, whether you share your work or not. Uh, I will say to any early uh, career researcher that jump through the hoops. To say what you, do what your research professors ask you to do and, and publish in as high impact journals as you can. Because later on you've got the choice that, like me, an old dog like me who's been around 120 years or whatever it is, you know, I, I can decide what I want to do with my research now. Uh, you, know, you don't have to practice what I'm preaching. Um, but uh, get yourself established as a researcher first. Get, get the, um, the respect and, and the esteem out there first, the indicators, before you um, then decide to become a maverick. That would be my best advice to you. Take for one more question, maybe two different ones. Mine's quick. Um, I was um, interested in the last one, uh, what you said yesterday, logic for the turbulent with evaluation. So that's my point is how are universities accepting this? Because they want their faculty, they want their PIs to bring in money. Yeah. And so, as you just said, you need to start a career, you need to be going jump through the hoops if necessary. Yeah. Um, but open access is not You see, it depends on how you define your business model, doesn't it? I, I, I'll give you the example of Unity. Anyone heard of Unity? They are probably the biggest games engine company in the world. Now you know who I'm talking about. They're the ones behind Doom and World of Warcraft, I mentioned earlier on, and, and many other games. And um, several years ago, I think it was about five years ago now, they took a business um, decision to actually make their entry-level uh, developers package available for free. So you could download it for free. And all the other games engine companies went, oh, what the hell are they doing? You know, these guys are idiots. You're giving away. And so what they did was they, they gave their entry-level package, which I think was something like, um, I don't know, a couple, few hundred dollars. They gave it away for free. And suddenly their user base went up from 100,000 to over a million overnight. And here was the deal. We're giving away to you for free this software. When you develop a game, bring it to us. We will evaluate it for you for free. 
and tell you what you need to do to make it a world-class piece of software. And then uh, we'll take 20% and sell it through all of our worldwide outlets. Bang. Suddenly, Unity became the largest games-based company in the world. It's an interesting model. You give something away at free up, up front, and then you charge for something later on. And I think it's a model that many, many universities are adopting. I mean, you look at FutureLearn. I know FutureLearn's in trouble right now, but FutureLearn is a conglomeration of many universities, both here in the UK, in America, and Australia, and very, various other places. I think there's something like 25 partners or something. They don't quote me on that. But um, the point is they're giving away a lot of their content for free in MOOC format. But what happens next is you either pay for the accreditation at the end of it if you want an accreditation, or you go off and you do a full course with that university that supplied that MOOC uh, for free originally. And again, that's a similar business model when you look at it, isn't it? So I think that, that some universities are wising up to this possibility of giving stuff away for free and then later on recouping the rewards when people come for accreditation or whatever. And that, I think, is, is, is going to be, to, to be an increasing trend. Okay, Brett, can you uh, have a bit of time wise for going to try and catch up? Uh, so, if that is your problem questions for Steve, you will be here for a short period before you fly it back to Perm. So, can we all please thank Steve Wheeler? Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>